Welcome back to From the Burbs to the Tetons. We're going to be talking about soundproofing your home. So let's start off with a little bit of science. I'm going to kind of do a Cliff Notes version of sound and sound waves. If you want an in-depth version at the end of my science talk, I'll go ahead and put a link to um, one of the guys I watch on building science. He's literally doing a series right now on um, sound and soundproofing an audiovisual room, uh, a home theater. So sound travels as a wave and it needs a median to travel on. And the median it most usually travels on is air. Um, just as a comparison, light does not need a median. It creates its own median by including a photon in the wave when it travels. That's why light can go through uh, a vacuum and sound cannot. There's nothing in the vacuum for the sound to to carry on. So sound is produced in a wave and we're not sure why it does that. It just is what it is. Um, that wave is generated usually by a vibration in you know an object and then the vibrations moving back and forth produce a wave in the air. There's several different characteristics related to a wave. Um, you know, the frequency, short frequency, would be um, a high pitch, a treble. A long frequency like this wave would be bass or a, a low pitch. Um, a very high wave would be loud. A short wave would be soft. Um, so, you know, these waves, they go from zero to, you know, infinity. Um, but what we can hear is about 20 megahertz to 2,000 megahertz. I'm sorry, 20,000 megahertz. And most of us can't hear that whole range. That, that would be if you have really, really good hearing from, you know, both ends of the spectrum. I would suspect that most of us are more in the 40 to 60 range at the bottom and anywhere to, you know, 16 to 18,000 at the top. Most of the sound that we're used to listening to is between 100 and 4,000. So like speaking and car motors and all that kind of stuff. So there's primarily two ways sound is produced and travels. One of them is resonance sound, so it resonates. Um, and, and there's two examples of that. Um, I'll put a link to a video here because I couldn't find one that wasn't copyrighted, even though I don't want to take the chance on using something copyrighted. But remember they're in probably elementary school where they did tuning forks. They hit one, set two of them on the desk, and they grab the one that they first hit, and then you know the other one's vibrating. Now they use little sound tubes that they put them on and hit one, have them next to each other, or the sound goes through the sound tube and hits the bottom of the tuning fork and makes it ring a little bit. It doesn't do it as loud because it's only doing the resonance through the air versus a solid object. So that's one example. Another one is the Tacoma Bridge Collapse, um, which I'm showing you the video here now. So what's happening is the wind is hitting the bridge from the side and causing it to reson resonate. Um, and so resonate that way it would normally go up and down like this okay now then then you know through studying this and realizing you know they didn't use a good mix of materials which we'll talk about later um, to prevent the resonance um, the wind is also catching this which is took 15 17 years of study to realize that um, the, the solid walls of the side guard railing uh, was acting like a sail and the resonance just made it worse. So it, it was kind of like one plus one is equal to five because the two were helping each other. The wind was catching it as a sail. That sail um, motion was vi vibrating and causing the resonance. So the sail effect would be going side to side, the resonance this way, and that's why you got this twisting motion. So that's a little science on, on 
you know, re resonance and how they work. And, and just about everything has a, a natural resonance. It just how pronounced it is. Is it enough where like you are, you've got the, the bridge that it's, you know, really, really bad. Um, another area you might think about is your kitchen sink if you've got a metal one. Depending on how fast the water is hitting the sink, um, how big the stream is, it, it's going to make the sink vibrate and you can get it to a point where it's like really loud and then you know you you turn it another way and it's soft and muted. So uh, again uh, almost everything has a resonance. The question is how loud is the resonance once it's met? It's not whether or not it has one. Um, and this is for pure um, materials, not mixed materials, not composite materials. And, and that's a very important distinction. We'll talk about that later. Now the other thing that you've got is, is forced vibration versus a resonance vibration. You, you can force something to vibrate, which a perfect example of that would be hitting a piece of wood. Now, when you hit a piece of wood, you're going to hear this thack really loud, like, right? That isn't the hammer hitting the wood. That is the air escaping between the two objects. Just like a, a thunder, you know, lightning hits, it gets heated, it expands very quickly, and then it contracts, and you get thunder. Um, same thing here, and that's exactly what you're hearing when you hit a piece of wood. Well, most of it. But down deep underneath that thack noise, you might hear a thump. And that thump is the hammer hitting the wood, the wood vibrating, and then putting out a sound wave. And it's not nearly as loud, and it's much lower in pitch um, versus the higher pitch of the air moving in and out. So that's a good example of forced vibration. Let's talk about IIC and STS. These are general summary type um, ratings for materials on how they react to impact isolation and the other one is sound transmission isolation. So the impact isolation would be something hitting, right? So I'm walking on the floor. Um, I can't think of another good one for in a house, but walking on the floor would be the most obvious one. Um, the, the sound isolation would be us talking, the TV in the other room. How well can I hear it because the sound's traveling into, you know, another room. So those are two ratings that are used a lot on materials that are considered to be, that are going to be used for soundproofing. The problem is, is that uh, there's a lot of materials out there that you can use for soundproofing that one wouldn't think or aren't marketed for soundproofing and they don't have any testing on them. So it's hard to tell you know, how they're going to react. The other thing is, too, is that uh, companies have now started going past the STC and IIC ratings and actually putting um, how they react in a range of um, noises from, let's say, 100 hertz up to 4,000 hertz. And that's really important, and you'll see why here. So we've got three materials, and the scale is from 20 hertz to 2,000, 20, I'm sorry, 20 hertz to 20,000 hertz. And so what we want to do is let's say this is its resonance where it will transmit sound the easiest. And let's see what the next material resonance is. So the next resonance goes here for the next material and and then it, the next one's here. Now do you notice anything about how the resonance stack up in the frequency range? Okay, so notice how there's an overlap here. So what's going to happen is this composite is actually in this frequency range, just this one frequency range is going to actually do a really poor job of sound inhibiting or sound I don't want to call it soundproofing because soundproofing is a misnomer, right? I mean, you can't soundproof something without using a vacuum because sound will get through because there's vibrations. Will the human ear be able to pick it up? Probably not. 
but it will be making sound. Um, so if we take a closer look at these three materials, this composite, there's an overlap in this Hertz range of good resonance on all three um, products. And so what's going to happen with these three materials, that range is going to easily make it through the material. And I don't want to call it soundproofing. Soundproofing is such a misnomer. Um, materials will do three things. They're either going to deflect it. So often when you can hear something very easily, it's because the walls are deflecting it. Depending on the angles and the wavelength, it, it can be just as loud as if you were sitting there, even though you're 40 feet away. Um, that's a whole interesting science into itself. Um, then it can um, disperse it, meaning it breaks up the wave. It doesn't continue it on, but it also doesn't deflect it. And then if it's in a resonance that's a, a natural resonance for that material, it will um, continue on the wave. It will repeat the wave. So here we've got a narrow section where it's going to repeat the wave. Um, where there's no overlap, right? So this area to the left, the area to the right where there's no overlap, it's going to do a wonderful job at reducing the noise there. Um, where it overlaps, it's going to do an atrocious job. And where it overlaps a little bit here and there and stuff, it'll do a decent job. It should do a pretty good job. So let's, let's mix up the materials a little bit. We'll use the same color scheme, but let's bring something up here. Now, this is going to do a great job of sound proofing, sound inhibiting, sound reducing, because there's no overlay. And none of them overlay anywhere. So so for the green to actually produce that sound, it's got to go to, through two layers that are going to be dispersing it. Um, same with the blue. It, it will you know, it get its way to the purple material pretty easily, but after that, the purple and the green material are not going to um, you know, continue it on, it's going to disperse it. Well, I guess it could reflect it too, but it, if you're, all the materials that we're going to discuss are mostly non-reflective materials, or at least one of the materials is non-reflective, so it should help with that. Um, and if you really have a problem with this, then you, as far as reflection goes, then you need to um, put things on the outside of the wall, uh, there's things that you can put up on the wall to, to reduce that. I'm not going to go into that because I really want to talk about composite um, materials that, that work together, that are touching each other. So let's talk about the floors. The floors I'm going to be doing pretty much a complete homegrown kind of thrown together system. And then the walls I'm going to do more of a traditional using soundproofing materials. Um, there, there are several third-party soundproofing materials that um, there's this, I guess it's called green glue. Um, you put it between two layers of boards and I guess it dries kind of rubbery or whatever, but it, it reduces the sound. Um, it's about 70, 80 cents a square foot. Not too bad. Um, and then there's another one that you don't put between two materials. Um, silent running I think it's called. Um, I'll put a link to both of those down below. Um, I'm prob uh, the, the silent running is more for covering industrial things that are noisy and then it converts the sound to heat. So let's go ahead and talk about what I'm going to do for the floor. So the first layer is going to be Advantech. This is not Advantech flooring but and it's only three-fourths of an inch piece of plywood but It'll have to represent a one inch Advantech layer. Okay, and then on top of that, I'm going to put six mil rubber. Okay, so I'm going to put that down. And then on top of that, I'm going to do a half inch. Okay. I think that's a half inch. Yep. It's a half inch. It's two one-fourth inch ones put together, but it's going to be a half inch of cement board. And then on top of that, 
I'm going to put the, uh, well, either warm board or echo warm or some product that holds PEX tubing for radiant floor heating. And then on top of that, I'm going to put this cork. It's got a wavy bottom to it. And then on top of that, we plan on using hickory flooring. I didn't want to cut this up um, just so I could do this little put together because it's, they're all, I'm missing stuff and it's not all the same size and all that good stuff. And you guys will get the idea that this is approximately, you know, kind of a cutaway of what the floor is going to look like. And then the wood would go on top of the cork. The cork should keep it from squeaking and stuff. Um, so the wood, I, I tried to find some place where it would give me an STD. It, it, I couldn't find any place. Nobody wants to say anything. I'm assuming that the wood is just going to be average, kind of in the middle. So let's be generous and say, let's say it's 10 SPC. This is about 50 SPC. The, I, I couldn't find anything for the, the cement board, but I've got to think that it's going to be in the, you know, 75 range. And it also should do really low, I mean good on um, lower frequencies. And then, again, a piece of wood, 10. Um, this is an older model, I think, of a, of a new model they came out with. So I think this is about 60 SPC. The new one's around 70. So if I go 50, 70, another 70 for the, um, the, the, the cement board, the wood collectively maybe 10. So that's 50, 70. 230 so what about 240 250 SPC in general it should give a fairly quiet upstairs oh well, that doesn't even include you know this um, and and one of the reasons why I'm going with a whole bunch of different materials because each material is going to have its own range of frequencies that it does well on right um, so I'm I'm you know, pretty excited about doing it this way. Um, yeah, the floor is going to be, I don't know, about three and a half inches thick. And then, you know, then I've got to worry about soundproofing around uh, holes I'm going to put in the floor to get electrical and plumbing and everything up else upstairs. So I'm going to probably use 6-inch conduit, maybe 4-inch conduit. I'll, I'll figure that out when the time comes. Um, I'll drill a hole straight up through, put tubing in it. And then I'm going to use fire caulking top and bottom because even though it'll be a pain in the butt to do, I can punch a hole in the fire caulking, strip it away a lot, put a new wire up, and then put more fire caulking in it to, to shut it down so it, it's airtight. Um, and I'll put one on the top and one on the bottom. I could even take some, a uh, couple of strips of um, the, the safe and sound uh, rock wool and, and put it in there if there's big enough gaps where it would make sense to do that. So that'll keep it pretty airtight and sealed up from you know, top to bottom as far as you know, cables coming up into the apartment versus downstairs. All of the um, outlets will get sealed up, at least around the master bedroom and the bathroom and the kitchen wall there. Um, so the sound isn't going back and forth between there. I, as, as I said, I'm going to keep it simple for the wall. The wall is probably going to get um, either rubber or cork in it. So what will happen is I'll put the drywall up on the um, room side of the master bedroom. I'll use this to put a layer and I'll just staple it up against the drywall on the inside. Maybe use some 
um, green glue uh, to, to seal it, to, to frame it, you know, to picture frame it. Um, some tape. By the way, tape is going to be used, you know, something like zip tape or, or uh, I'll have to do some research on, on what's a better soundproofing, but I'll probably just use zip tape because I'm right now I'm planning on using zip for the sheathing on the outside of the house. So I'll have it anyways. No reason to get another tape. It'll do good enough. And also we'll try and checkerboard the, the patterns differently on each layer. Um, clearly the, the tube layer for the radiant heating, I'm not going to have any choice on that one. I'm just going to have to follow the pattern that I come up with. But the rest of it I'll have, have choices. And then, um, you know, the, 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 in the wall I'll, I'll do a um, safe, and, safe and sound layer. And then uh, if there's still room, I'll do a regular bat behind it. Because leaving air in there, I, I, I know some people think, well, air is going to be an insulator of the sound uh, to a certain point. And that has to do a lot with the cavity and how big it is. Because if the wavelength of the noise is just right, it's actually that chamber will, will um, amplify it. Think of a um, church organ with the pipes, right? there's very little noise going in the bottom of that but because of the resonance of the size of the pipe it you know it's really loud so you don't want to get that kind of chamber thing going on because we really want all these materials to to be dispersion um, layers for the sound and not reflective and not a uh, resonance layer that will let it travel easily through it we want it to disperse um, you know, the other thing I'm thinking about, too, is sound panels on the roof above noisy um, equipment, so that way the noise as it's going straight up will hit that and not ref bounce down and reflect, because wood does do a fair amount of reflection um, of sound. Um, the loft. So the loft, what's going to happen is it's going to get a layer you know, of tongue, tongue and groove, probably six inch. Um, I'm not, I, I might be using pine, but um, I'm, I'm thinking about using um, not, uh, knotty alder um, for the wood. So that will go along the roof. And then on that, I'm gonna then put um, rubber. So there won't be any Advantech. I'll probably put glue up there to try and keep the squeaking down. And then instead of a half inch, right, I'm just going to use a fourth of an inch. And then on top of that, I'll do the cork. So it'll be... It'll be um, like this. So you'll have the the six inch uh, knotty alder here, right? The rubber fourth of an inch, the co the uh, cork, and then the wood again. So can't think of anything else to to cover at the moment, but that's that's kind of the general way I'm going to go ahead and try and insulate the workshop apartment are from, you know, sound. Uh, I'm trying not to say soundproofing. <laughs> Look, I, you know, this, this is a complicated subject matter and there's lots of different things that go into uh, sound sci science and I'm by no means an expert. If we were talking about electricity or uh, movement of objects, then I would, uh, I really studied that stuff a lot when I, when I was studying mechanical engineering. I'd have to buffer, buff up on it a bit, a little bit more because it's been a while since I've um, studied it and all that kind of stuff. But it was one of my passions, so I, I'm, I'm pretty good with that stuff. Um, but still, sound, sound and sound waves, you know, it's all physics. And there's certain things it can and it can't do. Uh, as far as energy and the way it 
transfers the energy and dispersion and multiplying. Um, and if, if, if you're not sure what I mean by dispersion, the, the best way to look at this, and I, and I, I wish I had, uh, you know, was out there and at least had something built where I could set up like a little lab to show these. But if you throw a large rock into a pool or a lake that's kind of calm and everything and you make these ripples, then take a, a handful of small rocks and throw them out into the ripples and see what happens from those little ripples that those rocks create. It will disturb the natural you know, wave effect of the big ripple and it will calm right down very quickly compared to just sitting there and you know, rolling out there forever. Um, and, and that's what we want. That's what we want the cork to do, right? We want it to disperse the wave, break up the wave. Um, same with the rubber. Sound is a very complicated subject matter. If you've got some questions that I didn't answer, please put them down below and I'll try and do a little research and see if I can't answer them for you. If you have some ideas on how I could do this better, um, that would be great. I'll, um, I'd, I'd love suggestions. If you think I'm missing something, um, you know, please put it down below. I'd like to get this right the first time. And uh, if you like the video, please give it a thumbs up. Would appreciate it if you subscribed. And I'll see you the next time around.